This week on the Backtable Podcast. This internal struggle that everyone has is that you need to get the top name program. You need to have the top of everything on that resume. And that essentially kind of justifies who you are, you know, and it, it kind of like argues that, okay, you're a good interventional radiology because you came out of said program. And I think what we're trying to say that is that while that has a lot of merit to that, some of the smaller places like our community program can offer a lot more for the long term. It's a beautiful thing. And, and that's really what Privademics is, is you don't get tunnel vision. Yeah. You stay broad and you keep it sort of open to what's out there and what the needs of your community are. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable Podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com and pretty much any podcast platform out there. Protect your most valuable asset, the skill and ability to practice your medical specialty. One out of three individuals become disabled during their career. Be prepared by establishing a specialty-specific disability insurance policy from the experts at DI4MDs. They represent all the major disability insurance companies that provide individual policies for physicians. Special discounts are available for all physicians, residents, and the military. Whether you have no coverage or to compare and improve your current coverage or take advantage of the new higher monthly benefit, contact them today at www.di4mds.com. Again, that's wwwdi 4 mds.com or call them at 888-934-4637. Again, that's 888-934-4637. This is Aaron Fritz as your host this week. I'm really excited to introduce our guests today, Dr. Shamit Desai and Dr. Saud Ahmed. Welcome, guys. Thank you so much for having us on the show. Really excited to be here. Thanks, Aaron. We really appreciate it. And uh, we pick up so many great things on the podcast every week. Appreciate everything you do. Yeah, thanks for reaching out today for our audience. We're going to talk a little bit about lesser known training programs. And before we jump into that, you know, I want you guys to tell us a little bit about yourselves, like where you trained and where you're at. And then also just tell our training audience real quick why you chose IR. Yeah, I can go ahead and start. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you again. Um, you know, my name is Saud. Uh, so I'm actually from the Chicagoland area, but I did train at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And um, since then, I've been back here in Chicago, and uh, we're currently, Shamath and I are both in practice in the south land of Chicago uh, at uh, Ingalls Memorial Hospital in Harvey, and also at Franciscan in Olympia Fields. Personally, I got into IR because uh, I heard a lecture when I was a med student at Rush, and the first thing the guy told me was, I play Nintendo for a living, and it sold me. <laughs> so, uh, as an avid gamer myself, so that's kind of my <laughs> origin story into IR, and it just kept going from there. Thanks, Sal. That uh, that's uh, what's your big, what's your favorite game since you're a gamer? Currently, I'm playing the new Halo uh, Infinity, and it's pretty sweet. So, yeah, what system is that on? That's on the Xbox. Xbox, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, sounds good. I'll have to look into that. My son's got an Xbox, and I'm always, I, I, you know, we get kind of bored. We go through games pretty quick, so I'm gonna. Try. I might have to try that. <laughs> Shamit, tell us about yourself. Hey, everyone. Uh, so I'm Shamit Desai. So my story is a little bit different than Saud's. Um, my father is actually an interventional radiologist, and uh, uh, he, he practiced as a cardiac and interventional radiologist. So the majority of his practice was coronary interventions um, as an interventional radiologist in the 80s. Wow. He, fantastic doctor, uh, you know, amazing dad actually inspired my older sister, uh, Anisha, as well as myself to both go into his field. You know, I, I sort of feel like the prodigal son because I was uh, super, super into ENT, well into interview season uh, as a fourth year med student. And I just took radiology as a kind of a uh, an interview elective during that time. Um, I didn't plan to really go to many of the lectures, um, but I was assigned IR in my first week um, with John Nosher at uh, at Rutgers Medical School, and uh, it was just it was just life changing. I mean, I immediately switched all my applications to radiology a after just one day with uh, with Dr. Nosher over there at Rutgers. Um, so I did my training at Northwestern after Rutgers Medical School, and I was there for residency and fellowship. Okay, 
Yeah, that's interesting about your dad. That's wild that, you know, I guess he was like truly one of the, you know, pioneers of, of IR if he was doing cardiac work. Yeah, I mean, uh, seems like practice has uh, evolved quite a bit since then. I mean, his stories are pretty wild. Um, what's interesting is that uh, Saud and I are lucky enough to work with a fantastic senior partner um, here in our group, uh, Perry Gilbert, who's been practicing for about 35 years as well. He's He's a little younger than my dad. And the stories are so similar. Um, the adaptability and the flexibility of an IR really, uh, really comes through as kind of like this linchpin of our practice. And it just, I mean, it's, it's inspiring every day. It's, it's, it's super cool. And it's, it's, it's so similar to what my dad, um, talks about as well in, in, in his, uh, in his early practice. Yeah. And, and we're, today we're going to talk a little bit about the kind of private demics type practice where it's, uh, you're out in the community but you have trainees and how these programs, um, they're, they're, while a lot of them are, are tend to be smaller in size, they do put out really highly qualified interventional radiologists. And we're going to talk a little bit about that and, and specifically about your program. But for, you know, clearly this has an advantage. This is good information for the trainee who's looking for programs. But I also want to make it useful for the private practice docs and even academic docs out there who are looking for to hire people, right? And so um, I want to touch on some key aspects of, of these programs and how it's, uh, you know, why they put out such great uh, interventional radiologists, and, and we'll kind of get into that. Um, so for, for both the unfamiliar med student and those of us who have been out in practice a while, can you guys tell us about like current training program pathways and what you guys offer at your in your practice? Absolutely. Currently, we have a training program at our hospital at Olympia Fields, Francisca, and it's the St. James Radiology Residency Program. But within the program, we are credited for ESIR, which is the Extra Specialization in Interventional Radiology. So that is one pathway to get into interventional radiology. The other pathway is the, uh, the direct interventional radiology pathway, where you apply directly from medical school into the said program. That program will guarantee you all six years from uh, your internship year all the way to the final year where you're specialized in interventional radiology. So it's all in one package. And many academic institutions have started towards that pathway. It was a uh, pretty profound and paradigm shift in how interventional radiology was approached. And uh, a lot of it was from the uh, leaders in SIR. The alternative pathway is the one that we have. So with ESIR, you apply and get into a radiology residency program. From there, you are qualified to do a independent IR residency. With independent IR residency, you have the option of doing one year or two year, depending on your radiology residency. And the ESIR has enough procedures and, uh, and, and clinical aspects to it that allow you to do a one year independent IR residency. If you are not in a ESIR accredited program, the independent IR residency would be a two-year program. So that's currently we are. So uh, in our program, you know, uh, we we have that qualification and the and the different types of benefits from that. Got it. And and uh, Sean, maybe you can answer this question: How are most IRs getting trained these days? Like, which pathway is the most popular or putting out the most IRs? Uh, you know, it's interesting. Um, Sal is actually our. Um, ESIR liaison and program director for our one ESIR spot per year. Um, we have four residents per year at our program, and he, he is the liaison for the one ESIR program. Nationally, um, it seems the trend is that there is about, uh, that there are about 160 spots uh, or a little more in the integrated IR program. Um, the, these data are from 2019, so there may be a few more spots expanded. And then there are a similar to slightly um, to slightly higher number of ESIR spots. When we look at data from 2017 and 2018, it does seem like the integrated spots, obviously in, in, in the way that they're being trained, have a guaranteed sixth year in interventional radiology with a graduation with with graduating with ER with IR and DR certificates. But for ESIR, um, there seemed to have been a slight mismatch um, for graduating residents with the amount of available independent spots. We, we feel as uh, though the more recent data uh, shows that that gap is closing, 
and hopefully some sort of homeostasis is now forming uh, now that the first few classes of ESIRs uh, have graduated. Um, I mean, we're happy to say in our very small sample size that all of our ESIR residents have matched in fellowships, and we're very happy that they've found uh, locales that they actually wanted to be, and they haven't had to be, um, you know, sh shipped off to places and take their families uh, to, to areas that they didn't want to go to. Okay. Yeah. And and um, can you give us a little bit more around uh, information around the history of your training program at your hospital? Has, how long has it been around for? Is it relatively new? And um, I th you guys may have already mentioned this, but how many residents per year do you guys have in your program? Yeah. So Shamit is correct. You know, so we vary between three and four years of residence, uh, but our, we typically have usually three years per class. St. James Olympia Fields, uh, the radiology residency program is a pretty long running radiology program. It's probably one of the oldest one we've had uh, in, in this area. Uh, it's It's been there for many years, uh, but the ESIR development uh, came about three years ago. So we started that designation three years ago. Uh, so that's kind of been the, the history of, uh, of that residency program. The thing is about our specific residency programs that we don't have fellows. It's a specific to just radiology residents. So Got that's it. kind of one of the nice perks about being in a program like this. I really like the term you use, the privademics. I don't think I've heard that before, but it's actually quite apt. And um, I think that actually um, really reflects some of the benefits that we can probably get dive into at some point in the conversation. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, so I did residency in a, we called it back in 28, 2008, we called it academic light. Mm -hmm. it, it was at Pennsylvania hospital in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania hospital, little community hospital in South Philly. That is actually the oldest hospital in America. Um, but they, it was under the umbrella of, you know, HUP, right. Of, of Penn. And so we were kind of, it's kind of like UCLA and UCLA Harbor. Like we were this sort of separate program from the the Penn program. But what was nice about it was that we are, all of our attendings, they weren't so sub sub specialized that they kind of covered, lar you know, a large amount of imaging. And so you kind of get a feel for what private practice was like when you were on your rotations. Also, when you're on IR, which is what I was really there for, you pretty much got to scrub on whatever cases you wanted to, because there was no fellows. And to me, that was the big advantage of that residency because, you know, when I started fellowship, I felt like I had a lot of the bread and butter stuff down already, like biopsies, you know, abscess drainages, many ports. And, you know, and then I was able to kind of focus on the high, you know, the high end IR, like we like to call it the more complex stuff like IO and tips and trauma and stuff. And so I wanted to, you guys to kind of tell us about your program, what kind of cases you, your trainees get exposure to. Because I think that really shows like the strength of the program. I think one thing uh, to be clear about is not all privademic or type of programs are all equal. So that's kind of really important. A lot of it is going to be the research of the applicant to know about that. Ours in particular, uh, I really do take pride in the fact that our residents are quite well trained from the beginning uh, in being autonomous. From the very first year, we make sure our residents are quite capable of doing ultrasound and CT guided procedures, biopsies and whatnot throughout their first year. And as they are progressing more and more throughout the program, they are able to get their hands more on the angio cases. We're fortunate as a program to have a robust peripheral vascular disease program, uh, to have a robust fistula program, interventional oncology program. And our residents really get to take part of that without anyone in front of them. And so they are one of the, uh, initially they're the second hands on the deck and eventually they become the primary operators on the procedure. And they have that ability. The nice thing about this is that they do this within a clinical environment. It's not just a ordering type of procedure and they jump in. They are involved from everything from clinical management uh, to uh, rounding and whatnot. Um, and it's not it's not just themselves, but also the the attendings too take a really strong part of it. Like Shamith here is very much an advocate for the residents, and he can probably speak a little bit more about that. Yeah, I, th I, th I mean, I think that was a great summary, Saud. Um, so one thing to kind of speak on is uh, the variability that Saud was talking about. Uh, no two programs are alike. You know, um, the things that I was doing as a fellow at Northwestern are very different than what the fellows at MD Anderson or the University of Kansas or, you know, the Arkansas uh, fellows are doing. So 
um, just as there's variability in academics, um, it really behooves the trainee that's coming in to ask the right questions when they are interviewing for these spots. Um, so when you are looking at a program that is in the community, you need to be asking, what is your clinical focus? What does your practice offer? When, when you get a, an answer like Saud gave, you know, that will excite a lot of trainees. There are trainees out there who are, who are looking for IR light, uh, you know, who are looking for more bread and butter, port placements, and uh, and abscess drainages as as the bulk of their career. I think that's probably going away with the way that IR training is going overall, and people are 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 very excited about the higher end procedures. But I'll tell you uh, myself personally, you know, things do change um, based on where you're at personally and 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 in your career, and 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 having a great foundation is the key. Um, so so for us, it's really. It's really good that we that we set that really good foundation in all of our trainees. So basically from from the first year, our residents are answering the phones and they are picking up um, IR consults as if they were as if they were fellows. We do our best to train them as to um, clinical management and we're always available and ready to train them. But that's a huge part of our program, um, as Sal mentioned, is is the one on one interaction with the attending to the resident that. That's often different than academics, as there as there can be, you know, many layers between the junior residents and the attending. I think that's a great point. I think the atmosphere can be different. I mean, I don't want to speak about how all other academic programs or other community programs are, but in our particular program, there's a certain collegial atmosphere between the attendings and the residents. Um, you know, it's really friendly, and it's kind of like we have that relationship. So our residents are really free and open to ask us anything. They never hesitate to be a part of anything, and we rarely ever say they can never be a part of something. Uh, and so that barrier to entry is so less, um, and that hesitation. And so that's one thing that's really great about being in that small program. It's just like a small little community, and uh, you know, it just kind of has that uh, that culture and atmosphere. Are there any big challenges in recruiting good candidates to your program? I mean, you know, everybody kind of loves to hear the big name places and they got interviews at these big name places, but are there certain types of candidates that you tend to attract that, whether it be regional or certain program training programs, IMGs, for example, can you tell us a little bit about the makeup of your, of your candidates typically? It's funny. Cause I just went through the recent rounds of residency interviews and, um, Look, I, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I mean, it's nice if your resume says you're from, you know, Harvard or Yale or Stanford. There's no question about that. And I think there's something to be said about that. There's no doubt. But I think one thing we argue uh, as a program is having to present ourselves as that smaller community, that type of culture. That said, in terms of how do we recruit people and whatnot, I personally... I don't necessarily always just look at the numbers. I look at the person I'm talking to and and see if they would fit into our program in terms of their personality, what their lifestyle is, what their interest is in the future. I think if you have an idea that you eventually want to go into private practice and uh, you want to see how that life works, there's no doubt that privademics and a residency program within a privademic setting would be ideal. You learn many things, not just things that are taken for granted. Um, one thing that's great about it being in an academic center is that you don't have to worry about the referral base. You know that generally that IR is going to be doing the tips, IR is going to be doing the the uh, the, the IO, they're going to be doing kyphoplasties. A lot of places have that an established type of chain. When one of the things that could be a culture shock when you come out of training from a big ex, uh, academic institution when you go into the community and practice is that none of those are a given. And how do you develop that? I think one of your recent podcasts talk about like, what does it mean to be a clinical program? And yes, it is rounding. It is seeing patients in clinic, but practice building is also an essential part of clinical interventional radiology. That's something that Shamith and I struggle with for the last few years. So, you know, we really want to develop certain programs that are not there and um, may have been there in a different place. And our residents get to take part of that. And they are along for the ride. They are very much an important part of creating that new type of uh, uh, of procedures, um, trying to develop programs. 
I know Shamit can probably speak more about uh, like something that we've been doing lately and, and how we how we do that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, Shamit, I want to hear more about that because uh, Sal's right, and this is something we talk about oftentimes on the podcast, is we get zero practice building training for the most part. I mean, maybe your program provides that, but at, an, at a big academic center, it's, it's rare to, to hear about that. It's definitely a given. Uh, you know, the, the, the funny thing is when I was at Northwestern, um, we used to call it the Purple Palace because IR is treated like royalty there. It is one of the greatest places, you know, in the world to travel, uh, to, uh, to train at. But I had a very tunnel vision view of what it might be like um, when I came out into real practice. And it was a bit of a culture shock. I'm not sure how it was for you guys when you came out, but for me, it certainly was. I, you know, I, I went into a private practice immediately out of Northwestern where I was covering five hospitals. I had a big geographic territory with uh, an underserved community and literally none of the doctors could name two procedures that IR did. They thought that we were the service for paras, thoras, and trialysis catheters. And trying to build up a Northwestern mentality in that community is hard when all you have to go on is your name. And what we find out here in the community, um, and I'm, I'm sure you experienced this, Aaron, um, you know, when you were at Pennsylvania Hospital, is that we are constantly kind of walking a line between educating other staff and our trainees and other trainees about what it is IR does and also satisfying what our program and our colleagues want uh, over on the diagnostic side. So, yeah. so for us, it's, it's just giving our trainees that are going into IR that insight, it's invaluable. It's a, it's a gigantic advantage for these people seeing what the majority of people who practice IR actually do out there in the real world. Um, you know, the phrase just another community hospital or St. Elsewhere is used, you know, you know, I guess technically we are the ush, we are that outside hospital, but, you know, we want to give our trainees a leg up in the real world with pragmatic advice on how to build a robust practice and satisfy the needs of our referrers because they're not going to be participating in major academic style research. And they're not going to be, you know, they're not going to get some of the, of the obvious advantages of being at a big name academic program. So we want to set them up with a practical approach to how to be a great practicing interventional radiologist. Yeah, that's that's a, that's great advice because um, it, you know, and me being a in a big group, you know, groups all over the nation are struggling to find good quality candidates who have that private practice perspective, um, and and you know, they want to bring in people who are going to build new service lines and add, you know, you know, build upon try to help out with the bottom line with, you know, reimbursement cuts. Okay. What else can we add as a service line that can help bring improve on the, on the practice as a whole. And so I'd like to hear from you guys, what kind of feet, like, you know, prior trainees that go out and they get a, they get a job, are they mostly going to private practice? And if so, what kind of feedback are you getting from them on like how well they feel prepared for their new job? We're really happy to see what's been going on with our past residents. Um, Many of them have gone on to really nice institutions to do their fellowships with. And from there, like Sham, Shamith mentioned this earlier, that all of them have gotten jobs in a private practice type of place for at the location that they want. Now, uh, the feedback we get from them are twofold. One, uh, they are incredibly grateful for the bread and butter, but also a lot of the body style training they received in residency. Um, when they walk into fellowship, a lot of times the focus is angiography things that are done in the, in the IR suite. And if they didn't have that prior ultrasound guided thyroid biopsy experience, which they did a hundred times in residency, they're not going to get it necessarily in fellowship and they have to figure that out in their actual job. And so they feel very comfortable and happy about that experience. That said, the other benefit to a program that is an ESIR is that radiology focus, the diagnostic focus isn't compromised. And that's not to say that it's it is in the uh, in the direct pathway, but the idea is that you're being also uh, inundated with a lot of that experience. And look, uh, looking at the reality of the job market, I'm, and I'm, I know, know Shamith will talk about this, but while it would be awesome if m many people come out who want to do IR get to do 100% IR jobs there, that's not the reality. There are plenty of jobs out there where you are required to do 
a certain amount of diagnostic responsibility. I know our program, we're, we're, we're uh, fortunate to have majority of IR, and uh, hopefully that's what's out there, but there's still a diagnostic component to our, our work. And it's pretty important to have that solid foundation. I think it makes you much more of a marketable person, and you can f rely on there for other things. One of our residents, um, he moonlights uh, uh, doing remote diagnostic work as an IR attending, and um, it's a great supplement to his income. Um, and it helps him keeps up the uh, the skill set that he spent five years working on. Mm -hmm. And um, additionally, they all tell me that it makes them a better IR doctor. Yeah. I just want to second that. Um, I know that the climate right now in IR is shifting. Uh, there is certainly a sea change going on right now. Uh, you know, IR has become its own accredited specialty. We have an integrated pathway for pe for medical students to come out and directly pursue IR. And we are all for that. And, and, and certainly our program supports the medical students um, who want to go out and pursue, uh, you know, the endeavor of becoming an, inter uh, an interventionalist that way. However, that's not the right move for everybody. There are many ways to skin a cat. We know that as interventional radiologists. And, you know, one way to do it um, is this ESR pathway or even the traditional four-year radiology residency and then just deciding afterwards and doing a two-year residency uh, independently and, and becoming an interventional radiologist that way. Saud and I are in a practice where we are only doing about 10% diagnostic radiology, maybe you know 10 to 15% if, if it's possible to put percentages on these kind of things. But we don't feel as though our, our, our interventional skills are, are eroding because we're doing 10 or 15% diagnostic radiology. In fact, I mean, I can't tell you the number of cases just in the past two or three weeks we've picked up just by being on the list. And when you when you talk about practice building, you know, being able to read a spine MR, that helps you build a kyphoplasty program. Mm -hmm. Being the one that every doctor in the hospital calls for a liver MR or a CT angiogram anywhere in the body, including the head and neck, that builds rapport with the referring providers in your community hospital. And it makes you the trusted person when it comes to doing the peripheral arterial disease or, you know, or treating that aneurysm. And, you know, I think it speaks a lot to our ability to hold on and not erode our DR skills. And I, I just want to emphasize that to trainees. You know, our, our focus is the trainees in our program, and we do emphasize that to them pretty often. I'll, I'll tell you, um, one, of my, one of my mentors at Northwestern was uh, Bob Lewandowski who is, you know, a very well-known interventional oncologist, interventional radiologist, just one of the most practical guys you could ever meet in the world of interventional radiology. And when I came to him as a first-year resident and asked him to do, you know, whatever menial task I could do to get my name on some paper, he said, you know, come back to me in two years and for the first two years of your residency, focus on being the best diagnostic radiologist you possibly can because that's what's going to make you a good IR. And those words have stuck with me, you know, to this date. And I'm probably not as good as of a radiologist as he'd like me to be, but, <laughs> you know, I'd like to, I'd like to think his, his words ring true. Yeah, I think that uh, you guys brought up some great examples of really taking advantage of the, those diagnostic years to, uh, to, to have that skill set, because that does give you an advantage over other, other specialties, right? Vasco surgery and emergency cardiology. Even though we try to be as collaborative as possible, when it comes to being able to read those that imaging yourself and knowing the nuances and, and so forth, that really Absolutely. does help you be a better IR. Uh, and, and we all know that, you know, we can tell our diagnostic colleagues all day long, "Hey, if you see a if, if you see a compression fracture, let me know. Let the ER doc know that we do that." <laughs> but they don't. They don't. Nah. They just move on. They want to move on to the next case. They don't have time for that. And so Absolutely. when you're reading it and you're able to call the ER doc up and remind them that, hey, we provide that service line, it does, that's help, that helps you immensely in building that practice, you know? Yeah. I mean, I want to give a shout out to Shamith here. I mean, that's exactly what he did a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're one of our hospitals, we're really trying to develop the kyphoplasty program. And um, we do have some, uh, a little bit of a uh, turf war essentially with the, with the orthopedics. And so what... Shaman did was he was reading on the list between his his cases and he saw a CT of the thorax and he picked it up and he read it and he saw that it was a compression fracture. First thing he did was walk, literally walk on over to the ER 
saw the head of ER there and just started striking a conversation, said, hey, look, we'll take care of this. Don't worry about consulting anyone else. We'll take care of everything from stern to stem. And uh, that bloomed into like a wonderful relationship. And so that's something that wouldn't be possible if you're not there at the forefront of picking up those right. cases. So it's exactly what you just mentioned in, in reality. Yeah, because the diagnostic guys, they might mention in passing, oh, hey, our IR partners can do this for you. But if you don't have that direct contact contact and relationship that you that you guys are building, then they just go to whoever else made that contact. And chances are the surgeons are have already done that, you know? Absolutely. Especially when you have uh, yeah. Shamit's charming personality, it, it definitely wins go. them over. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> or, or, or persistent, I'd say. It's probably, <laughs> probably more apt. You know, and another thing I'd say to that is, um, you know, um, as Sal mentioned earlier, I just want to uh, kind of harp back to it. He mentioned it's it it's it feels like more like a family, you know, with, with within the residency here. That goes beyond the residency. That also goes to the feel of a community hospital as well, right? So our refers, like we we know them by by first name, you know. There are not thirty neurologists here. There there are not a slew of fifty ER doctors here. Like we know the handful of referring ER doctors and family medicine and internal medicine doctors that work with uh, with our communities down here in the Southland of Chicago. And we know them all by first name. They know our phone number and they give us a ring. So that is the beauty um, of, of a program like this when when our residents get to know some of these providers by their first names. And, you know, they, they start to trust these residents as well by the time they're third and fourth year as well. And, you know, that it, it, it does help you start building rapport for things that are otherwise a given in, uh, in, in some of the larger programs out there. Yeah. One more advantage I wanted to talk about, and then I'll let you guys give some final thoughts. But um, my wife and I talk about this a lot in terms of job finding. But when you're in training and you're in that last year and you start looking for jobs, a lot of people, and not not to dog on academics, but a lot of people in academics, that's all that's the only place they've ever been, right? And they don't have solid job advice unless you're looking to get a job at that institution, especially if you're looking for jobs in, pri in private practice they don't they never been there they don't know what private practice is like and a lot of times they're poo-pooing private practice mm. and and so i have met and th this happened to me when i was looking for a job is i actually reached out to my mentors from residency because they were in private practice and had had multiple job experiences to ask them hey what do you think about this job what do you think about this job what do you think about this contract and that was much more helpful than my home institution where Again, you know, they just, that's the only place they'd ever been. So they, they didn't really have a whole lot of advice for me in terms of finding a good job for me. Any, any, uh, any thoughts on that? That's honestly, you hit a nail on the, the nail on the head there. So uh, look, if, if you're coming into an academic program and you really have the mindset of becoming an academic clinician, you know, I, I think that's a great networking within that, that sphere. But uh, I'll tell you personally, the private IR world in the Chicago land area is pretty small. We all know each other. And so we have our, uh, our, our fingers on the pulse. And so many times I will hear about a job opening happening with plenty of the, the practices around the Chicago area, and I'll tell my residents about it and can always kind of give them a good recommendation. Um, in fact, uh, one of my residents now, uh, you know, interviewed at a few programs that I knew the guys, they actually texted me and say, hey, look, what do you think of this guy? And I could speak highly upon them. And that's just the way the networking works in the private world. It allows for that uh, in a different thing. So if you are already thinking of the private world and private practice, I think that's what's nice about this type of, uh, this private demics type of scenario, specifically in the local area. And I know that's one of the complaints I've heard from uh, one of the residents in a, in a direct pathway program is that their attendings are claiming that if you sign with the program where you're doing some diagnostics or there's it's got part diagnostics, you're kind of making a deal with the devil. And, you know, and I and kind of see historically that has been an issue in the past where when diagnostics have run a group, they kind of don't give IR their fair share. But I think that culture is changing also where, you know, we realize that in any group, IR grounds the practice, right? Otherwise, it's yeah. a free floating practice that can be outsourced willy nilly, yep. right? Yep. So IR grounds it. And at the same time, in a group, IR is dependent on the diagnostic for what we just talked about before, about you know referrals and connections and being able to get these cases before, but also to help supplement the program as well. 
even financially. So, but uh, Shamit, do you have anything more? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think that that's that's like a that's a really important point, uh, and uh, you know, it, it's important for trainees to understand that for sure, because as much as everybody wants to be gung ho, one hundred percent IR, I just want to do twelve tips a day, and that's my life moving forward. That is not the reality of the world. Like that's not the reality of the world outside of the Penns, Stanford's, Northwesterns, uh, you know, rushes of the world where you're doing 20 complex cases a day. And I'll tell you, you know, for me personally, you know, um, Aaron, you have kids, you know, Sal, you have kids. Uh, by the time this podcast comes out, I'll, I'll have my second kid. You know, life really changes. When, when I was a second or third year resident, all I wanted to do was complex four hour cases every single day of the week. Now, um, in private practice where, you know, there, I can really hit a, a, a nice balance between life and work and I can practice in an extremely efficient way. I take a lot of things for granted that, that I hadn't before, you know, in it, it, the funny thing is in fellowship, a lot of the things that we would hem and haw about, about, you know, is, is this safe? Is this dangerous? Uh, you know, it, 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 is this the right way that this should be done? You know? Now we, we sort of take for granted that our experience and the experience of our partners and doing things in an efficient way has totally superseded the way that we used to think and, and act on, uh, on these cases. So, so for me, yeah, it's, it's, it's really important that it's a, uh, it is a different mindset and it must be considered when someone is in training that, that it is, it is different. And it's, it's, it's something for people that are considering different residencies should look into when they are interviewing at different programs, because unless you are truly looking to be a physician scientist, it's not for everybody. You know, and just to kind of add to that, I think the reality of the job markets is when we're looking to hire, we don't necessarily take where they trained as a huge amount of weight. You know, a lot of it is based on their personality just how they mesh with us uh, in, in terms of the group. And the reality is that the connection, like I'll tell you, I will take plenty of my own residents and rehire them. And in fact, we have offered them jobs. That's how proud we are of our own trainees that we're, we don't think that they're just getting a subpar experience and now they're off and good luck to whoever else takes them. Um, no, we're, we're, we're quite proud and we're quite uh, comfortable in taking them back. Of course, a lot of the uh, the, the actual independent residency that they get, the final IR residency, you know, that's probably where they're going to be known for more than their actual radiology residency, you know? And that's essentially one of the most important things is that you're not really locked down uh, by the name of your radiology residency institution. That's also the other thing that Sh Shamit mentioned I really want to stress again is efficiency in doing procedures. <laughs> you know, one thing about nice to have in the, in the academic world is the luxury of time. You know, a lot of your residents and fellows are doing the picks and ports and the thoras, uh, and you could spend uh, four hours doing a, a declot, uh, a, a venous case or something, you know, uh, like a complete reconstruction. You don't have that luxury in the real private world. And uh, we get to show our residents that, like, how do you do uh, a, a PVD case within an hour? How do you do said fistula cases? And, and, and so that's kind of a, a, another kind of perk that we have as a program. But yeah, I think really the idea that you're kind of stuck by your name, is not always the main thing. It's really about how you present yourself when you go for an interview. Great. Yeah. Solid advice, guys, from both of you. Uh, any final thoughts before we wrap up here? I mean, just, just coming from me. Um, so I have been in, in a few jobs now. I'm pretty early in my career, um, but my, my, my wife is an ultra specialized pediatric epilepsy doctor. And so her her job has kind of taken us around the country and then back, we, we found our way back to Chicago. Just kind of final thoughts is to, uh, is to really make this career work for you. Like make, like you, you are bound by interventional radiology to a degree, but there is a need in all sorts of communities and doing what's best for your life and, and, and doing what's best for, you know, your family often comes first, but I see it too often um, amongst my, um, amongst my colleagues where it gets sacrificed. And keeping your keeping your skill set diverse and and being adaptable really is the biggest and best piece of advice I can give. Like I am doing things now that I never even I never even uh, heard of in training. You know, I mean, I I was never um, privy to doing infrapopliteal P, uh, PVD when I was a trainee at Northwestern. 
And that's probably 25% of my practice now, hmm. to be honest with you. Um, you know, we have amazing colleagues here in Chicagoland um, through uh, through the Angio Club that, uh, that, that the guys at Rush set up. And we just uh, get to bounce ideas off of, you know, world-class practitioners like that. But, you know, we, we tend not to because our group is so is so diverse and our experience is so diverse that, you know, I can bring in a brand new device like like Spinejack and and get these guys on board to doing that. And then I can learn infrapopliteal disease from a guy who's been doing it for 35 years in Perry um, or a guy who's really mastered it like Saud, um, who's been practicing for about 10 years. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's 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 a beautiful thing. And, and that's really what Privademics is, is you don't you don't get tunnel vision. Yeah. You stay broad and you keep it sort of open to what's out there and what the needs of your community are. So we serve the Chicago Southland, but it might be completely different than what they need in central Oklahoma. And that that is what I take great pride in, you know, uh, providing service to this community. Those are great points, Jim. And thank you for your <laughs> compliment there. Uh, the reality is, and don't think a parting point would be is this, not everyone fits in the same box. I think there's this sense and this almost like this internal struggle that everyone has is that you need to get the top name program. You need to have the top of everything on that resume. And that essentially kind of justifies who you are, you know, and it, it kind of like argues that, okay, you're a good interventional radiology because you came out of said program. And I think what we're trying to say that is that while that has a lot of merit to that, some of the smaller places like our community program can offer a lot more for the long term. You have to kind of look at it not just in the span of the first couple of years, because look, I mean, sure, I'm sure if you have a name on your resume, you might be put to the top of the pile to an extent. But after 10 years of practicing, no one's going to care if you're making the same mistakes or you're not comfortable doing things or you have these personality quirks. But if you're just a person who just meshes well, it's a great person to to work with and you show your skill set and which, like Shamid said, like, I would say about 75% of the things that I do today, I learned on the job from great mentors. When you come out, get into a group with great mentors, and eventually you will shine wherever you come from if you truly have that drive. And then I think that Shamit makes a great point about diversifying your skill set. So I know this may not be the popular thing to say that, you know, it's ride or die for IR until you're like 70, but I'm sure <laughs> that lead is going to be wearing on that spine. After many years, it was going to be kind of nice to fall upon um, reading uh, from, uh, I don't know, maybe in 30 years, virtual reality or something uh, uh, and uh, and being able to still have something to provide a clinical and, and, and financial thing for yourself. So that's kind of the way we approach things. And whether that's right or wrong, it's not. It, it's it's really up to the individual. And that's kind of what we want to really stress. So for med students listening and that want to apply to y'all's program, is there an official name of the program? Our program is the St. James Radiology uh, Residency Program. It's uh, in Olympia Fields. We are on the ESIR website, and uh, you can click the link there and contact uh, us. Um, the website itself is the franciscanradiology.com. So if you can go onto that website there um, and hit contact, so Greg Henkel is the program director of the radiology program itself. So Dr. Henkel runs the radiology residency program. And I'm the program director for the ESIR. More people are more than happy to even email me at my first and last name at gmail.com. I'm more than happy to even vent for those types of things. And that's kind of the best way to get in contact with us. Great. Yeah. I mean, trainees these days are just so sharp. I'm like, you know, and I'm 10 years out in practice, but. I'm just happy to be part of the club. I don't think I would have I made the cut back, in, you know, nowadays. <laughs> oh, man. Totally. Dude, tell me about it, man. Totally. It's funny. I was at SIR in 2019, and I was hanging out with some of these residents uh, from other programs that were in the, in the direct pathways talking to them. And they were like, yeah, I was debating between neurosurgery, orthopedics, and IR. And I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, like those were not anywhere near my right. <laughs> first, anyway, what I was thinking of, I was thinking about maybe like ER and IR <laughs> and PEDS or something. But right. yeah, it's a different caliber of people out there, which is great. Um, and I think that's yeah, excellent that, yeah. you know. Moving the field forward for sure. Yeah. 
totally. But give, it, it gives so much more credence to like highlighting programs like ours where people really are going into radiology to become interventional radiologists. And just know you, you like th there are a lot of resources and, and people who are practicing out there who have a whole varied amount of information uh, of, of experience and, and, and will will definitely get you to where you need to be. Yeah. It is, it, it is tough out there. It is really tough out there from it what is, I hear. Man, it is, tough. <laughs> it's crazy tough. Well, thank you guys so much for coming on the show. Thanks for reaching out. Uh, it was great to touch base. And, um, and uh, yeah, let us, let us know if you guys ever want to come back on for, for any other topics. Great. Thank you so much for having us. Totally. Thanks so much for having us, Aaron. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, Brian Hartley. Our audio team lead is Kieran Gannon with support from Caleb Hodson and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Zubi Syed. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Anne Dang. And newsletter by Lauren Fang. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.